mit dem Sommer fliegt manch Jugendtraum. That's what it sounded like in Vienna just a few days ago, at the official ceremony to dedicate the country's new Wall of Names. It's an astonishing memorial to Austria's victims of the Holocaust. It was unveiled on November the 9th, the anniversary of Kristallnacht, and the event was broadcast live on Austrian national television. The wall has 64,440 names engraved on the slabs of granite. And alongside Austria's chancellor and other top Austrian and Israeli political leaders and leaders of the Austrian Jewish community who were there for the event was a 91-year-old Holocaust survivor from Canada, Kurt Jakob Tutor. Tutor lives in Toronto, and he spent the last 20 years pushing his native country for the memorial to happen. The new memorial isn't the only one in Vienna, but this one is accessible to everyone and has all the names, including Tudor's parents who were murdered in Auschwitz in 1942. So Tudor and others now have a place to mourn and light candles for people for whom the Nazis did not provide proper graves. Twice at the age of 12, I was, I barely escaped from having my name on the, on the walls, as opposed to being the person who makes the walls happen. I'm Ellen Besner, and this is what Jewish Canada sounds like for Tuesday, November the 23rd, 2021. Welcome to the CJN Daily, sponsored by Metropia. Kurt Yakov Tudor was born in Vienna in 1930. His parents ran a toy store and he had a baby sister, Rita. Hitler annexed Austria eight years later in 1938, and the country's Jews saw firsthand what was in store for them. On Kristallnacht, November the 9th, 1938, countless synagogues were burned, and tens of thousands of Jewish men were deported to Dachau and other camps. Tudor's family escaped to Belgium, but when the Nazis occupied that country too, Tudor's parents were arrested and deported to Auschwitz. The children hid in an attic. Yaakov was 12, Rita was 5, and they made their way to an orphanage where they were hidden by a network of Belgian Christians. For 50 years, Austria considered itself Hitler's first victim, and it took a very long time for the country to formally admit its complicity in rounding up and deporting and killing Austria's Jews during the Holocaust. In 2018, the Austrian government and provinces decided to go through a kind of truth and reconciliation process about their wartime past, and they gave Kurt Tudor's project the go-ahead, and they paid for most of the costs, with local businesses donating the rest. With the ceremony now done and the international media coverage quieted down, Tutor is back home in Canada. Coming up, he'll be here to explain why he's now worried about the lack of security measures in place to protect his wall of names from rising Jew hatred in Austria and in Europe. But first, here's what's making news elsewhere in Canada right now. I'm Aaron in Abbotsford, and this is what Jewish Canada sounds like. Funeral services were held Monday in Halifax for Dr. Richard Goldblum. The prominent Canadian pediatrician died on Friday, just a few weeks after the Jewish community unveiled a bronze sculpture of his late wife, Ruth Goldblum, outside the Canadian Museum of Immigration in Halifax, which she helped build. We've reported on that initiative here on The Daily. Dr. Goldblum was 96. He was originally from Montreal, They later moved to Halifax in 1967 to work in pediatrics, and the couple became community leaders and philanthropists, and they were married for 66 years. Kurt Jakob Tudor brought his family to Vienna for the unveiling, and he gave a keynote speech. While his sister and her family looked on, they had come in from Paris. Tudor joins us now from Toronto to describe what it was like seeing his dream become a reality. You know, when you actually were there on the stage, I mean, you must still be feeling it. What do you take away from this now that you're back in Canada? Well, the, it was very honestly meant. Austria needed to be reminded of its past, which it had barely begun to deal with. Um, we have to thank uh, Mr. Waldheim to a large extent because the government for decades cast a veil over the entire Austrian past. And it's incredibly huge participation in the Jew, the persecution of the Jews, which then ended up in murder. Eh? Why, did, why was there such a veil thrown for decades? Because as uh, Simon Wiesenthal once mentioned, at the end of the war, 
fully 660,000 Austrian members of the Nazi party had survived. They didn't die on the steps of Russia or otherwise, right? They actually survived. They were, after a slap on the wrist, reintegrated into Austrian society. And between them and their spouses, that would be a million people, one quarter of the voting population of the country. Did they want to be reminded of what they had done? And any party, whichever color, who would have built a memorial to the Jews from which it would be graphically evident that it wasn't just a statistic of 65,000, but every name represents a human being. A memorial on which, which actually spelled out these children, women and men were murdered by, well, you know who. <laughs> they would have lost 300, three, 400,000 votes instantly. And so, what's doch nicht wissen dick gemacht, as my father used to say. Do you know what it means? I know a few of the words, but put it together. But, uh, no. uh, one pretended one didn't know. And slowly these people became integrated into Austrian society. They made careers. They had... And in time, they also passed away. And then they were given a lovely grave in a beautiful cemetery with a gravestone and their name in 10 centimeter um, letters. And their children and their grandchildren could anytime come, say a prayer and more. But those of us whom these people had murdered, uh, those of us whose parents these people had murdered, we had no place to go. And we would be content with 15 millimeter size names, right? But lots of them. And it took all these years until there was a change in government, but it wasn't just the change in government. The new chancellor, uh, Sebastian Kurz, was at the time 33 years old. Any connection to an ancestor who was a war criminal was by now four generations away. And so I'm sure that helped a lot, his youth. But also, I got to know him as a real man, not as a politician. And he genuinely understood that once and for all, Austria has to come to terms with what its citizens had done, whether they were wearing German Wehrmacht uniforms or what, they were still Austrians. Eh? And that's why he voted for it. What but kind yeah. of security measures have been put in place to prevent uh, vandalism and anti-Semitic vandalism and graffiti? Uh, because that's the kind of world we're living in now. Yeah, it's not as bad as the world we lived in in 1938, but anyway. Uh, of course, yeah. and I didn't mean it that way, and I didn't no, mean no. it an insult. No, 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 I, I know you didn't, right? But I, I like to remind people, things are fairly normal nowadays. Eh? The security measures, as far as I'm concerned, are totally insufficient. When you come right down to it, it all right, this is worth 5.3 million euros. If I am of a mind of wanting to damage it, I can come there in the evening with a sledgehammer, and before you can say boo, I've done a half a million dollars worth of damage. Huh? Huh? Well, there is a police precinct in the area, and they said, Oh, we will patrol the area every two hours. <laughs> you can re yourself realize that that's ridiculous. Eh? I wrote a three page summary of what I considered the appropriate uh, security measures. And it boils down to hiring a security agency and having a person building a booth for them and having a person present there 724. And to give you one example, a, an Italian photographer had printed photos of survivors from different European countries, one meter wide and a meter and a half tall. And they were exhibited along the ring at 10 meter distances. 
that exhibit had already happened in 30 major world cities. No problem. In Vienna, somebody came with a pot of paint and a big brush and, and brushed every one of them out. Huh? So Vienna is a place where you have to be on your, you know, on your guard. I want to talk a bit more about that before we, we, we finish up. And that is that, you know, although many people say that, you know, Austria is Israel's best friend now and things have changed radically, which, you know, you are proof that that has happened and they've come to terms with it. Anti-Semitism, anti-Israel and anti-Semitism is on the rise in Austria as well, especially over the summer and the spring when the Hamas hostilities with rocket attacks on Israel mm -hmm. happened. They had 500... Uh, or so uh, incidents of hate, violence, graffiti, whatever, in Austria itself. I'm sure you're aware of that, right? Mm -hmm. And how does that kind of jibe or, or clash with what this big monument symbolizes? This monument has nothing to do with anti-Semitism today. This monument has to do with the virulent, all overpowering anti-Semitism of the past. Now, if that shakes the conscience of current present day non-Jewish Austrians and said, and that they say to themselves, my God, was my grandfather actually involved and my grandmother encouraged him? Huh? If it shakes them into that kind of thought, they will contribute to the situation today. And if they hear a neighbor say something anti-Semitic, they'll say, okay, you can say that at home, but not in my presence, for example, right? Well, Mr. Tudor, congratulations on finally seeing this come to, to light after all this work and kola uh, kavod for what you've done. I, can I just add one quick comment? Over the years, when it looked bleak, as if it would never happen, much as I believed in it, right? Um, I'm not saying this to boast, but no shortage of sleepless nights, no shortage of you know, angry moments and anxieties, and yet this constant drive to keep going. And two things happened. I wanted to know whether letters of one and a half centimeter in height would be sufficient to watch from a meter and a half. And so I typed out the names of four people and glued them on the walls of my office. But I took names from the real database, Helena Landau, Gietl Landau, this is a real name. And Ellen, as I was typing, it was late at night, I suddenly had the feeling that these people were standing behind me and saying, keep going, Kurt, we want to be remembered. I mean, this is not some kind of, you know, th this felt real. Huh? And the other thing, I made it in the end. But 4,000 children didn't make it. And whenever I needed to give myself some courage, I said, remember, Kurt, it's wonderful that you made it. These 4,000 kids didn't. Do it for them. Huh? I know it's hard. Do it for them. And it's amazing how much strength that can give you. And that's what Jewish Canada sounds like for this episode of the CJN Daily, sponsored by Metropia. Integrity, community, quality, and customer care. Today's listener shout out goes to Alan Levy of Toronto, who listens to the podcast when he sees an interesting episode on Facebook. And we'll end the episode with a little more on the Wall of Names Memorial. It's not the only way Austria has been trying to make amends for its wartime past. It's offered to restore Austrian citizenship to Jews who had to give theirs up during the war and to some of their descendants. So far, 6,000 people have taken it, including Yaakov Tudor and also Mark Bissell of Montreal. His father, Eric Bissell, survived the war by fleeing Austria for shelter in the Dominican Republic. The Bissells didn't attend the Wall of Names ceremony, but... The younger Bissell likes what Austria has done to come to terms with its past, and he likes it so much he now serves as the honorary consul of Austria in Montreal. The, the amazing thing about this, it was, it was sponsored by Vien the, the Austrian Republic. This was a state project, um, and this came from f state funds, and I, I think that's important that they 
did not solicit private funds for this from community members. This was about the government uh, taking responsibility and, and acknowledging their past and, and the real estate, prime location, uh, the cost. Um, it's really about Austria's uh, beginning to make reparations for the past. Mm-hmm.